It's very clear to me that how we invest capital and how capital flows, and in particular how banks, what banks finance, is very much a critical leverage point, perhaps the critical leverage point, in, um, in resetting an economy in a way that actually is, um, is regenerative and therefore sustainable over a long period of time. We live today at the intersection of an old economy that measures wealth narrowly, based mostly on short-term financial gain, and a new regenerative economy that measures wealth in terms of the health and well-being of all human communities and all natural life. Capital Institute is dedicated to exploring this crossroads and to supporting the transition to a regenerative economy. And we found a great place to study this transition and how difficult the challenges can be with First Green Bank. First Green was founded by Ken LaRoe, a successful Central Florida banker who set out to build a profitable bank driven by his passion for the environment. As it has turned out, he has faced many challenges along the way. This area is was historically rural and agricultural, uh, very, very low population. Um, it's exploded with um, as a bedroom community of Orlando, there's a lot of sprawl, a lot of unmanaged growth, which is uh, rips my heart out, honestly. I'm just determined to not let this place slip away and go the, the route of many other areas in Florida. In 2006, after the successful sale of the first bank he founded, Florida Choice, Ken went on a soul-searching cross-country trip. I started a bank in 99 and sold it in 2006, right at the peak. and. Um, got all the money and made a bunch of people a bunch of money and had a non-compete and couldn't work in the industry for a, a number of years. So my wife and I bought a little mini motor, motor home and we put a trailer on the back with all our bicycles and fishing gear and we circumnavigated the country. And before I left, my brother gave me a book, uh, Let My People Go Surfing, which is an autobiography of Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia Clothing. And it was, uh, it was his life and how he reluctantly became a businessman and with the ethos that you could do right by doing right and, and everything, every element of his business is, is operated and developed under that premise. And I thought, well, geez, if he can do that in the clothing industry, which is a pretty rough industry for environmental um, sustainability or regeneration, well, you know, I can do that in the banking industry. Banking is the only thing I know, so why not try it? So I Googled green banks and um, that led to the concept of, of first green bank. And um, we, I came back and called my attorney and gave him the idea and he said, well, yeah, let's, let's go forward with it. So we filed the application and went through the process of raising capital. We raised uh, $17.2 million um, in the worst capital environment there could ever be in 2008. And on December 22nd, 2008, we were granted the last bank charter ever granted in the state of Florida. And there's been none since. Um, we just passed our six year anniversary in business and our financial performance is in the, the top quartile of all banks in the state of Florida. First Green Bank was indeed outperforming on a financial basis, but now the hard work for a bank with a values mission lay ahead. At the beginning of 2015, only about 11% of First Green Bank's loans could be considered loans to values-based businesses. So now the question was, could First Green Bank also outperform as a values-based bank? a bank fully committed to regenerating the community and the economy in which it operated? In June 2015, Capital Institute visited First Green Bank with Stuart Cowan. Stuart uses systems thinking to help regenerate communities and organizations. He asked Ken and his staff to imagine the bank as participating in a larger story that was about Central Florida's regeneration. So we're seeing the beginnings of a regenerative economy here in Central Florida, that the seeds are here, and a single community bank like First Green Bank can be a hub, can be that connection point for lots of businesses that want to work with each other. Um, I think 
really a regenerative economy is an ecosystem of organizations. It's not about separate kind of visionary one-off businesses that have to figure out how to build all of this from scratch. It's about that community, that ecosystem of regenerative businesses. They're playing off of each other, they're learning from each other, and they're literally exchanging materials and services. It's, they're circulating. In January 2016, knowing the difficult challenges that lay ahead for First Green Bank, we asked Vincent Stanley, Patagonia's Director of Philosophy, to visit with Ken at his lakeside home. Vincent asked Ken to focus on where First Green was succeeding in having a regenerative impact in Central Florida and to continue to build from there. In the past year, or, and, and, and especially kind of looking forward from this period, are there, do, do the values you hold and that the bank represents give you an opportunity to make a kind of loan that hasn't existed before? Have you found new opportunities there for kind of creative creative work in, in banking that you couldn't have done at the bank you owned before? I, well, the one thing that comes to mind is our solar loan program mm -hmm. that we offer for residential and commercial mm -hmm. um, solar installations. Um, it's a product we developed in this bank, but we refined it over the last seven years. We just kept saying, okay, what what makes it irresistible, what makes it where it's a no-brainer um, to the point where I think it's the best solar financing program in the country. Um, we've never even had a 10-day delinquency in our entire portfolio That's of our solar loans. And I think we're at about $2 million now, which isn't a big number, right. but it's a large number of loans. Yeah. Um, so we're really encouraged and um, enthused by it. Vincent also encouraged Ken to reflect on how his deep roots in the place he was born opened up a path for First Green Bank to be a powerful agent for change in Central Florida. I think there's a, from looking from the outside, I think there's a really strong advantage in doing what you're doing in a place in which you're really rooted. So you, you're really testing the values you've come to hold against the values of the place that you came from and you're doing something in that community that will also change over time it will change the community it will have an impact it may not feel like it and i know it's hard first green bank can be proud of more than its innovative solar and hybrid vehicle loan programs the bank also actively seeks out borrowers like you kent an organic blueberry farmer who converted his land from conventional citrus farming and is committed to living in right relationship with the land he cultivates. This all started for me uh, about 10 years ago, 15, 10 to 15 years ago. I met Ken LaRoe. Um, I live on a, a farm that's been in my family for four generations since 1890, and it was up for sale. And my family decided they couldn't hold on to it anymore, and I looked for a banker who would understand what I was trying to do in, in uh, buying it. and, uh, and um, making a living from it and trying to do something a little bit different uh, for the local economy, trying to preserve a piece of Central Florida history. Building a solid portfolio of values-based loans like the one that First Green Bank extended to U Kent's farm takes time. And time did not appear to be on First Green Bank's side. Pressures to sell the bank were building. Ken talked with Vincent about how his track record as a banker who turned green to gold was in many ways a double-edged sword. He knew that it was raising investor expectations for a quick sale of the bank, perhaps before the values mission could be fully realized. One of the hardest things is the shareholder expectations, which of mm -hmm. course um, I helped set from the start. The, the model in Florida banking is you start a bank, you build it up, and you sell it, and there's a liquidity event. Yeah. And um, it's historically hasn't been real hard to to um, to land investors because that was the model and they knew and you could yeah. kind of calculate what their return would be. But I'm, I'm all, I've been troubled since fairly early on that um, the values proposition will go away yeah. um, if if the bank was to sell. And so I've gone through I, probably every iteration there is mm -hmm. of what could this look like, how could it end, yeah. what does it look like at the end of the day from uh, 
converting to a B corporation, doing an IPO, to yeah. seeking um, uh, values aligned institutional investors, whether it be a family office or a foundation um, that could provide a liquidity event for the people that wanted it and anybody that wanted to stay in for a longer play um, to trying to find a dance, suitable dance partner that would be values aligned um, in the values based financial institution space. Um, and I've tried a bunch of them already and, and they haven't come to fruition. How should and how could a values based bank grow? Capital Institute asked author and regenerative business advisor Carol Sanford to explore those possibilities with Ken. And what I heard you describing is how you really grow this business, not just grow it and scale, but grow it in terms of what you're able to achieve as a result of it, because the intention is part of the growth, right? How you take the story, what you feel, how deeply you feel it, and use it to grow a business. So what's exciting to me is you're not going to grow it in any normal it wouldn't be the way other people would think about growth. It would be this deeply embedding of the values you have in how you grow and not being torn between those, just being fully on top of that. And I also can hear the idea of how much you could change an absolute industry, which is so archaic. I mean, banking is just, it loans, I mean, all that stuff is very much based on what we were doing in the 18th century from everything I've read. And this innovation, the idea of how you're going to grow by innovation is just exciting to me. Carol also asked Ken to experiment with creative ways to engage his staff, to invite them to be true collaborators in the bank's regenerative journey. I mean, the other thing was fun talking with you about is what your change in how you want to engage with your team. Uh, because part of what it takes to bring that focus inside is to engage all the members of you know, they're not just your direct reports, but everybody connecting to that. Uh, and having them it not just be about you, but it, everybody feeling like it's about the bank and it's about the bank and what it can do in the industry. The research shows that if you develop people while you're engaging, that means you have them grow as people. You have them do reflecting on themselves. You have them observe what's happening to them while they're working. You teach them a different framework for doing it. And both of you are entering into a space that you're learning while you're creating, and I mean learning at a personal deep level, that then it goes much deeper. And you get a little destabilized in the process because you're having to do something you aren't usually doing. Mm -hmm. What we also discovered in talking to First Green Bank staff was that many were yearning for that kind of exciting, destabilizing leadership that would provide a space for everyone in the bank to draw on their potential to help the bank broaden and deepen its regenerative impact in the places where it was doing business. Among them were two ministers. They had originally been drawn to the bank because they saw it as a place where they could bring their spiritual values to the working world in a meaningful way. I, I, I see things, the potential within First Green Bank to change the earth is significant, but all it is is potential. Because, as I've said before, I say again, you can put signs on the wall, on every wall, and you can say this is a regenerative bank, this is a environmentally conscious bank, you can plaster those all over every wall, put them in the bathrooms, in the break rooms, in the conference rooms, on the TV screens, everywhere you want to, they can be everywhere, and yet mean nothing. They have no power, because the sign doesn't have a power, it doesn't speak, it doesn't have a voice, it doesn't have energy. What has energy is the people that are in the building, the people that are in the organization. And at some point, it has to get to a place where it's no longer the signs on the wall, but it is the, the vision becomes the life, it becomes the blood of the organization, and it literally is contagious to every person that walks in the building. They don't have to see a sign that says we're regenerative. They feel it. Um, so, so before I came to the bank uh, a couple of years ago, I actually was a United Methodist minister, and I did this thing called church planting. And when you church plant, you develop a church from kind of from scratch, I guess. Uh, and you got you you talk to people about the vision of of a different kind of church, a new way of, of, of doing church. And you, you offer that vision to people and you um, try to get people to, to come and, and live into the vision and be a part of, 
of that new way of, of doing church. And I, I think that's where we're trying to go more here in the bank. And that's the hope that I have that we can develop in this Central Florida region is that we can send tentacles out throughout Central Florida and just have people live differently because they're banking with us. John Fullerton, Capital Institute's founder and a former Wall Street banker, spoke to two First Green Bank board members, Dr. Robert Purden and Randy Strode. What emerged from that conversation was that both were authentically committed to First Green Bank's holistic values, but at the same time, they were struggling with the expectation that they'd held from the start, that they would reap the financial rewards from their investment when the bank was eventually sold. And I just really believed in Ken. Mm. When uh, I came to Florida, I had an Afro Fu Manchu, a single, and bell-bottom trousers, as good a hippie as anybody, and I was going to save the Florida alligator, Lake Erie, the bald eagle, you name it, I was going to do it. And then found out maybe how shallow I was. I got married and had financial responsibilities, three little boys, and that all went by the wayside. Mm. But then I... Uh, have an opportunity now to, to go back to those roots. And yeah, I'm just, uh, like I told Susan, I said, uh, you know, I, I for some reason want to impress Ken. <laughs> you know, it's just, he's he's had, that, had that kind of effect on me. And it's just, it's good. It's good synergy, I think, between mm -hmm. Ken and I. John Fullerton spoke of First Green Bank as a precious asset. It had, he said, a vital role to play in an economy where so much was at stake. So real investments, you know, what we invest in and, and bank lending is way more important than what we spend all our time paying attention to, which is securities trading. And so the securities trading has become the financial system, but that's just pushing paper around between, you know, one owner and another owner, and it doesn't actually translate into what changes on the ground. Whereas a bank, you know, a relatively small bank, like for Screen Bank, but it's actually making loans primarily into the real estate uh, industry and and you guys know way better than I but this part of the country is growing like crazy and how it grows is is really very important so the impact that a bank like First Green Bank can have on these issues of environmental sustainability are are remarkably um, significant and um, so so I've gone from being interested in working on sort of high finance on Wall Street to now being much more interested in real banks that are making real loans on the ground in a productive real economy. Um, it takes time to build a business. And, um, and the conventional wisdom and conventional approach to community banks was to start them, grow them, and sell them. And yet that doesn't really match with the, you know, a 25 year mission of a, of, a, of a bank, much less any other kind of business. So now what do we do when we've got this precious business building um, that it may be that if it was sold to, let's just pick on my old friends, J.P. Morgan Chase, yeah. it would disappear into yeah. the... Um, I think that a, a bank with a great idea that, that appeals to millennials and people who are concerned about the environment, if they grow quickly and in a, in a meaningful way, in a profitable way, that just speaks to the, the greatness of the idea. And so I don't think they're necessarily in conflict. Uh, growth and profitability and success of the economic model, yet I think it's going to be also driven by the um, the social model, how you how you have an impact in the world, you know, promoting solar and conservation and and having a, a forum in which you can actually speak that truth to the rest of the world. And the bigger you are and the more successful you are, the louder your voice. Mm -hmm. So. So I look at it that way. So, and as far as, you know, growing it to, to sell it, um, we, we talked about it, we had a board retreat. And, we're, you know, if we're gonna sell, we want to have those values on the same side, on the other side of the table of the people acquiring us. And if they don't have them, then maybe we can inculcate into that. Maybe we can impregnate them with that mm -hmm. set of values, which like Unilever and Ben and Jerry's, we can maybe have an impact on the world that way. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I represent a consortium of investors, 
and we put a lot of money into this and we want to see a return. So there's only three ways banks can make money and that's to give you dividends, go public and you got the shares of stock and all the benefits of that or else you can be sold. And, and so those are the three ways to create a, uh, a net return on your investment. So. But is there another possibility of a net return on your investment that's defined in greater than financial terms? David Korsland, an advisor to the Global Alliance for Banking on Values, thinks so. He talked with Ken about how he might begin a conversation with his investors that would define returns in terms of what you give back to your community and the world you leave behind for your children and your grandchildren. Well, but, 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 but it's a real question because if you if your your investors end up with with shares and have a solid return that they can give to their children and their grandchildren, that's also real. That's real value. That's real wealth. And but I, but but at what point? You know, going back to the question, what's your trade off? What's the trade off you want to inspire them to between what you're doing for your spirit and what you're doing for your pocketbook? Yeah, so it's a safe financial return and a super values return in terms of what you're doing for your community. It's a, it's a different way of thinking about uh, meeting investor demands and then getting and then inspiring the investor to say, that's, the, that's, that's what I want. I want to leave my grandchildren a, sh a share of stock that I know will give them solid income every year and at the same time leaves a community which they live better off with jobs, with an environment that's safe, and with, uh, with healthy and, and happy people. First Green Bank now finds itself at a fork in the road. There are many possible scenarios for its future. What is certain is that the women and men who have joined First Green Bank and have had a taste of a new way of banking and doing business in the world will be forever changed. We're certain that they will go on to change the face of banking and to participate in new kinds of collaborative, regenerative businesses that will transform the heart and soul of our economy in Central Florida and beyond. But what I'm really interested in is for the, from the people who do the real work, who don't get the awards, who don't go out to, off to dinners and fancy places for meetings, you know, what's it like to operationalize a values-based, regenerative agenda inside a bank in Central Florida. That, to me, is what's really interesting. I mean, operationally, it's fantastic because we feel like we're coming to work every morning for much more than just a paycheck, more um, to really make an impact on the community. In Central Florida, specifically, um, it's, it's been great to see such an immediate sort of impact where if we were in a market that was already sort of oriented to sustainability or social responsibility on a large, short, broad scale. It may be, it may be not so obvious, but here I kind of sometimes joke or, or equate it to bringing water to the desert, and you just immediately see the sort of impact where the education and the influence aspect of what we do really sort of takes root and almost perpetuates itself. It has truly been a, uh, a journey for us and, and people ask all the time, well, what, what's a green bank? I can tell you that whatever it is and whatever we do and whatever you do to try to, to become a values-based or, or maintain a values-based business is really, really hard. Um, and anybody that says otherwise is, is, is not being um, truthful or transparent.